All right, so it's five o'clock. Um, so welcome you all to this uh, panel on how to make remote HCI teaching useful, engaging and exciting. Is your online course really better than a book? So this is going to be moderated by Albrecht and me. My name is Florian Alt. I'm from the uh, Bundeswehr University in Munich, which translates to the, uh, the University of the Ch uh, German Federal Armed Forces. Um, I have a research group on usable security there. And um, yeah, so uh, the idea for this, we can almost call it series of panels emerged a few weeks back when we noticed that we as HCI researchers are facing a number of challenges, not only the fact that we cannot get researchers, uh, uh, participants to our lab anymore. So we had a nice panel last week there with almost 400 participants. Uh, I see we are this year like getting to similar numbers, almost, not exactly, 85. Um, and today we want to basically talk about um, how we can make HCI teaching engaging even in times where we cannot share the same classroom um, with our students. And um, yeah, there is a number of uh, interesting questions here. So for example, how can we avoid that students get bored from having to watch hours and hours of video every week. Then most of us at some point made a decision uh, to become academics because for us it's fun to teach, to discuss with students. And the question is, how can we preserve that at this time? And then the third point, and uh, Albrecht formulated that nicely on the website, is how can we basically prevent that this is actually the starting point uh, of a lot of very bad online courses. So how we'll run this, uh, this discussion is there is a panel of five or six um, uh, great people who are all experts in the field, but you want to make this a very interactive um, experience and we ask everybody to contribute at any time. There is a um, chat, a, a Zoom group chat. If you have any questions to the panelists, just uh, write them in there or raise your hand. So we'll try to bring this up. Um, I try to, to keep an eye on that. And we will start with uh, two minutes where each of the panelists get some time to briefly um, introduce uh, themselves, um, share their experience and put forth a statement before we enter into a more open discussion. And I'll just have a, a clock on my smartphone here, uh, which will count down, down from two minutes to zero. Um, you cannot see it, so, so there's a challenge here. Um, and yeah, I think with that we keep going. I'll very briefly introduce the speakers. The, the order in which we're going to do that is the, uh, the order on the websites. So the uh, first speaker will be Albrecht Schmidt, who is a professor for human and computer interaction at LMU Munich. Nick. So Albrecht, here's the uh, two minutes for you. I have to switch my audio on. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I'm quite excited to have this discussion and I think it was quite selfish. We had a number of ideas how to put teaching forward, former colleagues, former students. We had a lot of phone calls over the last weeks, how to make teaching engaging. And what would I see at the moment? We are not at this point that we are lacking material. There's a lot of material out there, most of us, is really in bad quality. So be it video, be it audio, be it classroom recordings. So we have a lot of material that's out there uh, that was collected by people, but it really is not of a, a high quality. And I think what I see now, a lot of people say, oh, it's easy. We just, yeah, let it run, give them exercise sheets and uh, see what happens. And I think for the current situation, this may be a very good thing. But if this is sort of, something that becomes the new norm because people get probably used to not having to go to the classroom doing other things uh, instead so for me it's really the question how do we take this as a chance rather than sort of a starting point of something bad happening how do we take this as a chance to engage with students and as you said earlier Florian for me sort of teaching is one part why I really like that profession I, I like to interact with students I like to discuss it with them and recording videos and sending them to them is 
something I was not really sort of planning to do for the rest of my life. So for me, it's, uh, I think I come with a lot of experience of recording stuff, but not really a lot of experience how to get good engaging remote experiences. And I just uh, sort of looked something up um, in 1964 when television became mainstream in Germany. And I share my screen because it looks funny. Uh, okay, I, I can't share it. Uh, so what I have on my screen is a video from 1964 where the Bavarian uh, broadcasting tried to make a dancing class on television. And they ran a number of those dancing classes. It was basically just where everybody thought we can do teaching now, we can do it via television, everybody will have a television. It didn't really run very long and apparently not very successful. So the idea there was television, it didn't really change schools. We still have to go to schools. It didn't change universities. Similarly, people were excited with multimedia around 2000. Again, sort of, it didn't really. So we haven't figured out how that works. And so I'm really excited that we are now nearly 100 people to at least spend some time and collect experiences how this could work. Thank you very much, Albrecht. That was a bit longer than two minutes, but since you're the co-moderator, that is fine. <laughs> we move on to our next panelist, and it's my very pleasure to introduce uh, um, Alan Dix, who is the director of the Computational Foundry at Swansea University and author of a, a very famous textbook that most of us have read. So Alan, maybe, ha maybe have your experiences and your statement, please. Two minutes for you. Okay, um, I'll put my timer on because that'll help me keep an eye. Um, yeah, so um, I've actually this, today I've been a pupil in a, a Welsh learning class done virtually, which was, uh, so I've been getting some, some real experience and maybe that will come up again later. Um, also, my daughter is in, is staying with us and is doing drama, teaching drama remotely as well. So, so there's lots of um, successes around. And for me, a transformative part of my educational experience was when I was in school, I used to listen on Saturday mornings and at about six o'clock on other, other day mornings to the Open University programmes, which are straight television ones. And it, it, it made me who I am as, a, as an academic. So, so really crucial. Um, oh, crumbs, that's nearly half my time already. I'm a bit of, I feel a bit of a fraud because I've actually haven't been doing much teaching recently, um, but I have done quite a lot of this recording things and passing them on. My earliest sort of straight university experience of this was back in the late 90s when the universities were trying to push people to do more online stuff, not usually video at that point, but, but often um, web-based, for reasons of saving money. And anybody who has actually spent time doing any online materials will know it takes a long time. It doesn't save money. Um, so one of the things I looked to there was how to deconstruct experience, make it look at say, what is it that we get from a lecture? What is it we get from a lab? And then ask that. Um, one of the key ones I find is about excitement and motivation, and that's one of the difficult things. Books give you the information. Um, one of the lessons I learned, I'm not going to have time to talk about time management, but one of the lessons I learned when I first did some video stuff was I did my first videos with the camera on the screen, and I spent four minutes gazing at the person at the other end, which was very disconcerting. And I made a very tiny change, which is I put my camera, I had a second webcam, and I put it slightly away from the screen so that I moved back and forth. Um, oh, help, 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 stop, stop, stop. Sorry, that was my timer going off. I can't stop. Oh, well. I'll sit on my, my, my um, microphone now, so I can't hear it. Um, oh, I've lost myself. Anyway, it's interesting how really tiny change in my practice completely transformed that video and made it far more engaging. So there are some small changes as well as, um, as, well as big ones. Anyway, sorry for this thing. Actually, I'll go and try and turn off now. Oh. And I still haven't learned how to use my phone. <laughs> Hello? Florian, you're muted. Okay, sorry for this. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan, for, for your statement. Um, we get to the next panelist, who is uh, Orit, who is a professor of computer science in, uh, and uh, a director of the Human Computer Interaction Lab 
uh, at Wellesley College. All right, are you here? Yes, thank so uh, thank you. It's, uh, I'm really glad to be part of this uh, important discussion. I feel that as we transition perhaps from kind of remote emergency teaching to uh, really think about new normal, it's an opportunity for us to think about design principles for online teaching and how we're going to create courses that we're going to have fun with and the students are get uh, to be engaged. So I teach at Wellesley College, which is a small liberal arts college for women next to Boston. You can see it in my background. Uh, and as I typically teach my human computer interaction and tangible interaction courses, my classes are kind of small, they're highly interactive, they're hands on, and they typically have 18 to 30 students. Uh, I'm not teaching this term, but I'm preparing my online HCI course for the next term, which will start in a couple of weeks. And we're thinking, what can I do to recreate some of the important experiences of in-class teaching? So I have three design goals for my course. The first is to foster a sense of community, which is typically important for collaborative learning, but I think is even more important during the times of social isolation. Uh, the second principle is to integrate creativity and hands-on making, which I think is what make our discipline fun. And the third is to encourage students to work on real-world problems that are meaningful for them. So the project theme for this term is going to be designing technology which helps people to become more resilient. And together with the students, we're going to unpack what resilience means for different user groups. So one way in which I try to bring these three goals together, and I'll throw it as a teaser and we can continue and discuss different methods later, uh, is I'm trying to teach some of my session using uh, Mozilla Hubs, which is a social VR uh, environment that doesn't require people to have a VR headset. And in this environment, the students get to choose their own avatars, they get to contribute to designing our virtual HCI lab, they bring their own 3D objects, and like in our physical lab setup, each project team is getting an area in the lab to present their shared project artifacts. So I've been using this for a while now with my research students very successfully. I'm excited to bring it to my online classroom. And um, in kind of later in the session, we can discuss some more how to uh, recreate these experiences and what kind of um, online collaborative tools for hands-on learning uh, we're experimenting with. Thank you very much for it. I'm really looking forward to, to uh, get some more insights on how you, you're using Mozilla Hubs in your courses. Um, do not forget to already uh, write questions uh, into the chat. Thanks, uh, Eva already started. Excellent. So, but before we get to the questions, uh, we have two more uh, panelists I'd uh, like to introduce themselves. So the next one is Adriana, uh, who is working in the web and internet research as web internet science research group in Southampton. She's currently doing a PhD there with a topic that fits the discussion very well. So she's a true expert here, uh, looking at factors related to student success in higher education and MOOCs. Uh, Adriana, are you ready for your statement? Yes, I am, and I put my timer on. Thank you so much for the invite. Oh, can you see me? Sorry, can you see me? Yeah. Thank you so much for the invite. I'm especially here with the lecture, such as students, just said. Um, yes, uh, I, I am the API teacher sent somewhere I'm able to move. So uh, it's been uh, a while on the books of being similar. Oh, I, I, uh, I really not hear you. I, I think oh. people, uh, so, so it may be useful to just stop the video while you while you give your, your talk, mom. just that we have enough. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, can you hear me better now? Uh, okay, so I'll uh, say that in my research, I've been looking uh, how best way instruction and books compare. Uh, there are really many. One thing is that book have been uh, using the video medium for teaching for a long time now. And what we want to avoid is the thing we start talking about that it's been uh, boring and students getting uh, fed up the same format. So the two ideas I want to borrow from the book learning environment is that the first one is to get peers to support each other. Uh, their learning. So the, an example would be using uh, making them do multiple choice questions 
which are authored by themselves and, and moderated by uh, by the lecturers or um, answered by peers. So you create a sense of community. And uh, in our research, that uh, it's in the teaser, uh, the paper is in the teaser of this web page of the, of the uh, group. Uh, we we discuss how uh, this can be used. Uh, the, Specifically, a PWAS system can be used for um, HCR teaching um, because the SEQ format tends to be associated with a uh, fact based knowledge, uh, which is more typical for other type of. Uh, oh, it says something scrambled here. I'm really sorry about that. Um, so I see yeah, this it, 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 it's really it, it's really difficult to hear to hear you unfortunately. Um, Andrew was just suggesting that we try to all turn off our videos for a moment and see whether this would fix things. Would fix things. I'm not sure I think whether it's that's the uh, uplink at that point. Oh dear. So, so I think uh, okay. so I think uh, perhaps you can, perhaps sort of you can go sort of out and go come in again and, and come in another again another people another people. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, should we wait for Adriana or proceed? I think we can start with Andrew uh, if you introduce him and then we, we have uh, Adriana for a second go. Okay, that's all we do. Okay, excellent. So um, our final panelist is going to be Andrew Kuhn, who is a professor of HCI. And he's also a great fit to this discussion because he's the editor of the education department of the IEEE Pervasive Computing Magazine. Uh, and uh, obviously has a lot of experience in this area and we are very much looking forward to hear uh, Andrew's statement. Thank you and thanks for mentioning uh, Yes, the, the IEEE for basic computing. Um, so whenever I think of, of teaching, I, I think of how do we train our students to generate new knowledge? I'm very much focused on that. And I think it's really important for us as you know, electrical computer engineers or computer scientists to carefully think about this because a lot of the education, practically all education that, especially at the undergraduate level, focuses on the specific tools of generating new knowledge. So things like what's the Fourier transfer by solder, or how do I create a chip and so forth, right? But not in general tools. So how do I create a hypothesis? How do I test it? What does that mean? What what is how do I look at other people's work? And so whenever I, you know, everything that I do for teaching, I try to to uh, also look at how do I help students become people who can ultimately generate new knowledge. So I'm excited about that. And I think that our online uh, teaching provides one opportunity at least for this, which is if, and, and I'm thinking about asynchronous courses, which by the way, I've, I've taught now for several years, and I, I actually do really like them. And asynchronous courses mean that students have to provide interaction and feedback asynchronously, which almost always means writing. And if you have to write something down that your peers are gonna look at and respond to, because this is part of your grade, uh, and your, your instructor will look at and respond to, then you really have to be careful about what you write. So I think one positive effect of, of the online teaching that I'm experiencing is that I notice that students do reflect and do a little more carefully write things down, which in fact is one of those key uh, skills that you need to have in order to generate new knowledge, right? So I think, uh, one aspect of online teaching that I'm really excited about and would like to think about how even better to, to take advantage of is exactly that. So people will be writing, people will be communicating in different ways, and how do we foster that and how do we utilize that to train them to uh, generate new knowledge? All right, thank you very much, Andrew. So I think we have Adriana back. Maybe we could try again whether whether the sound quality is a bit better now okay thank you for that i restart the things this happens when it's live and <laughs> um so i don't know how much of my previous scrambling went through uh but let me just start from the beginning you get another two minutes <laughs> Hey, uh, thank you so, so much for that so i'm trying to borrow some ideas from mooc learning that could be incorporated in our xci normally face-to-face -face teaching. 
And we, we, what we don't want to do is a, an hour lecture that becomes an hour video and the students are there doing nothing but watching us. So what we can do is just vary, vary the, the, the format a little bit. So videos don't have to be an hour long. So one thing the MOOCs do, they do small, small videos interspersed with activities they have to do and so on. So one thing I was attempting to do is plugging a paper that in which we talk about different type of video for HCI education, co-authored by Alan for, uh, and others, in which video, and we discussed the video, cannot be, it, it's not just the typical, the, the, the teacher uh, producing it and the student consuming it. There are many ways in which video can be used for education, HCI education. So another thing I'm gonna plug in is this other paper, in which we use video for coursework. We make students do a, um, a prototype, a lo-fi prototype based on some research. So they had to put a lot of work before they actually deliver the video, which is the ideal assessment. We make it uh, hard to do, but easy to assess. So they, in, in that paper, we looked at uh, students coursework that this was made in Southampton there was another case study in Newcastle and in which students had um, only four minute video but it took um, a lot of hours uh, to develop and again the problems have to be meaningful very much in the in the same line that Ori was saying so the the other idea that I also was telling you from MOOCs is to get peer support so peer assessment peer uh, make that community more visible online. So the idea I wanted to plug in is using MCQ software, which is peer-wise, and that is the paper that is in the website. So I will shut up here, but I'll let you uh, ask questions. I'm happy to, to give more information about that. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> So um, now that you've had uh, all the statements, feel free to uh, sort of post your questions in the chat. There is already some. And so while you think about more questions, I'll probably uh, get back to uh, one we had. So, so people are interested about Mozilla Hubs. And uh, maybe that would be a, a question for Orit. Maybe you can explain a bit more about how you're using Mozilla Hubs and how it specifically helps you uh, to, to achieve those design goals that you put forth, like fostering a sense of community, integrating creativity, uh, and, and encouraging students to work on real world, uh, uh, real world problems. Yeah, so uh, we've been using it in the last um, couple of weeks um, with my research students as a space to meet. And one thing that uh, the students identify as fun is that it's a little bit like a game. They choose their own avatars. Um, we design together the space. So every time I go to the meeting, before the meeting, the students actually prepare a few surprises. Uh, yesterday, there were a few spiders waiting for me in the room. Uh, and they bring uh, artifacts that they design. So we were holding um, kind of design and uh, share, so show and tell session. So that's also an answer to uh, Rob that was putting in the chat what kind of prototyping tools. So we use Tinkercad for the students to create 3D objects. So they get to design their own 3D objects and you can put whatever design prompt you want. And then they bring the design object into the Mozilla Hub room and they get to show and tell this project. So that's um, had been really fun. Uh, so it's a place to come together which is a little less formal than um, Zoom you have more dynamic interaction. It, the spatial aspect work really well. So you hear very well the people that sit next to you, and then you need to walk to someone to hear them better. So you can really walk around the room from poster to poster in order to discuss particular artifacts that are presented in different corners. So it had been very successful so far. My plan is to integrate it as um, uh, kind of once a week in every week we have four meetings one of these meetings will be a more of discussion session and it will be informally done in our hci lab uh, virtual space so i don't get the excitement of mozilla hubs sorry so i'm i'm sort of so for me i think there are two things the one thing is if i cannot see the people i'm interacting with I find this really odd. If basically, uh, sort of, if my 
counterpart is a spider or a penguin. I find it funny for sort of the first moment, but uh, sort of the non-verbal cues, uh, seeing now or uh, nodding, things like this, I find that so important. And I think sort of the whole excitement at the moment with current stage virtual reality, I, I'm really not, not getting that. I, I find it's very interesting for a moment to go in and but then sort of not having the face-to-face -face conversation, not having, uh, not seeing the person I'm interacting with. I, I find it nearly uh, sort of, it, it, it's a game, as you say, it, it's like nearly dehumanizing in, in a way. It puts us behind the shield. And, and I think the other part is, I think people talk about walking. What does walking mean in, in Mozilla Hubs? It's not walking. I'm now sort of, nowadays I'm sitting probably six, seven hours in front of a desk in my usual workday was a lot of steps between labs, between offices, between buildings. University of Munich has a lot of buildings. Not all of them are as beautiful as this one. So, but sort of, there's a lot of, uh, and, and now I'm, I'm sitting there and I talk about walking. So I'm not getting this excitement. What, what, what is, why am I not getting it? Uh, I think it's, um, it's, it's far from being perfect, um, very far, but I think it's a change of scene. And as you said, we sit in Zoom, students are having fun with virtual background. It's another way to mix things up. And for me, what is really important and what I'm having fun with when I teach is more informal interactions with the students. And that's a way to have this more informal interaction, playful discussion with students, uh, which is why it's part of my course, but not all of my course is being taught in Mozilla Hubs. It's a way to take a break, to try things differently. I think the key for success for us, at least, is norms, how we use this technology. So for us, the norm is that when you share your screen and present, you also share your video. So you actually see the person that present rather than a penguin present on the screen. And that helps with taking things more seriously. Uh, but yeah, it's a way, since we can't mix things up, and when I teach in my physical lab, I like to change the setup of the lab, depends on what we're doing that day. A poster session in the lab looks different than a design session in the lab looks different from a lecture. Uh, and that's just another way to mix the setup of the students without requiring them to move physically to a different location, which is currently not possible. I agree that there are multiple limitations. And the main reason that I chose that environment over others is that it doesn't require the students to have any special equipment. They don't need to have a VR headset to use it. And it's awkward, but it's fun. Any responses? I think Andrew had, had, had another question regarding Mozilla Hubs. Do you want to sort of respond to this? Sorry, are you asking Oris to respond to my question or me to tell her about my question? No, yeah, uh, I, uh, you, you should tell uh, real your question. <laughs> okay, thank you. So Oris, I was wondering how much you think um, the positive experiences are also tied to the social capital that was built up over, you know, the months or however long of, of physical meetings and how that the quality, the positive quality that you're experiencing? And if it does, how can we, you know, try to build that social capital in a different situation where it might be, you know, this is a course for people who don't know each other? Yeah. Um, I think that a core experience that I'm trying to recreate is really the, the physical aspect of my lab, which um, in the physical world, I designed to be a space where a community is coming together around, you know, specific areas of research and specific um, intellectual disciplines. Um, so we try to create that experience in different ways in an online course. One of them is to create a space that is more creative. And uh, I kind of chose a color scheme that looks a little bit like my lab and themes and students are bringing fun objects. Um, so far it had been going well. We have been using it with students that know each other. Um, in the next term, I'll be teaching a Wellesley HCI course. So it is a Wellesley course. People know each other. I don't know everyone yet, but there are some social capital aspects of people belong to start with to the same community. I don't know if I would start it with a course in which, um, you know, open to the general public, people that don't belong to the same institution or don't necessarily have some connection between them. And we'll have to see how it works in building a community. Uh, I just think like Albert said that um, we need to move around and we don't do that. And um, I think that's part of our embodied experience is to try different scenes. And that's part of building a community and a physical space 
is important. And since we can't have it, I'm trying to recreate that experience with a virtual space. Uh, I'll be able to share more after I teach a formal course uh, in this setup. Um, but for now, it seems more promising than just having Zoom classes. Yeah, right. Oh, Adriana wants to add to this. <laughs> sure. Hi. Yes, I was just uh, following on that. Uh, uh, the worry about building social capital when from scratch over video and, and things like that. It, this happens all the time in MOOCs. People who don't know each other largely collaborate and start commenting to each other and they, you know, they, it happens. So it, it shouldn't be a worry that it, it would be less successful for people who don't already know each other. That's my contribution. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So maybe we can uh, move towards uh, another topic that, uh, so, so one thing that Albrecht just uh, previously mentioned is that one of the challenges is that in online teaching, it might be difficult for us as a teachers to really observe the students, see what they're struggling with. Uh, and the question is uh, how we can address this remotely. Um, I know maybe, maybe, maybe Albrecht can add to this or has some experience how we, how we could do this. So I think that that's for me one of the big questions, seeing what people know, what they struggle with, how they work, what they are excited about. Sort of usually it's not a one size fits all. If we teach a big class, that's it. But if we teach a lab, it's very much understanding what students are interested in, what they're good at, what they want to do, and really sort of finding that, that out together. Uh, and I think we have sometimes courses with 10, 12 people, very sort of small scale lab course. And there's sort of this interaction to find out what do they want to learn. That's something uh, we, I, I find really hard, even in a sort of one-to-one -one conversation over Zoom or so. So I think this, this question, and also uh, I think that was one of the other questions in there. We usually work in groups. So we have students work in groups and, and the, the big part of what they achieve, the big part of what they learn is basically within that group, how they organize themselves. And we have been doing this now in a course at CDTM in Munich at the Entrepreneurship Center, where we moved virtual with these courses. And they, they, they develop skills in interacting, but it's a very different set of skills than if they're together in a lab. That's from accepting that people work differently, et cetera. So I think this idea that I can work how I want and I don't have to look how the others work, that's something we support now with online teaching, with the remote things. If you put four people in a room, they have to agree on things. They have to work together. They have to make compromises. Once we move it all online, everybody can work on their own time, on their own way. So I think we give them more freedom, but at the same time, a learning process of understanding that how other people are it may be sort of a benefit. That's something I find, find tricky. So, but this was more a lot of questions. So really, for me, this question, how do we get this sort of social interaction in these smaller groups beyond the technical that we, we connect them somehow together that we get these mechanisms going and uh, i haven't seen them neither over zoom uh, over uh, so the gaming community has some of it but uh, i have very little experience in that so does anybody have experiences here so this is this uh, remember that it's also about learning from each other so if anybody has a good idea of how to do this please please share it also, if you're not, yeah, I was going to throw two things in here. Um, so one was actually, I said, positive experience this morning um, in the Welsh cast. There was uh, it was a very small one. I was going to say, um, and there was somebody there who I'd never met before. But we went into a breakout group together. We we interacted, and you and I have noticed with a few people. Um, irrespective of this, not in this period, where you sometimes forget whether you've met them online or not. You know, if you have video, com you know, if you meet people by Skype. Um, and also, I, I got a little bit of a scare at one point because the tutor clearly could listen in to the breakout groups. I didn't realize that you could do that in Zoom. <laughs> so, and she came in with, but, but one of the things, so there's two other things. One is, um, in large classes anyway, we do not, this ability to see Things. You get the sort of the eyes, the glazing eyes, but it's a problem we're all facing anyhow. If you have 300 people in a room, it's not a new problem of video. This how do we um, maintain the engagement, get groups together. These are, uh, these are long-standing problems. 
Interesting enough, though, I don't know how many people know about Peer-to-Peer -peer University. Who's, I mean, there's not many faces I can see. Anyway. So Peer-to-Peer -peer University was set up, I think, about 10 years, perhaps more ago. Um, and it's, it's, it is peer learning. People set up courses and stuff. And it started off with relatively small classes. There were like 20 or 30 people mutually interested, very high levels of, of, of engagement. Um, and then it grew. And suddenly all that, um, the, so, that, the social thing that means that you learn because other people know that you're learning and you, you work that started, to, they, they didn't know how to create that. And they created a whole set of software for building groups based on things like time zones, a variety of ways. You know, some of it was random, um, that recreated relatively small mutual learning groups, all done at vast scales. So this is moot scale stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't like, like to say absolutely, you know, everything can be perfect, but um, incredibly successful. So there are some good um, patterns out there. So we had some uh, discussions, as, as, as some points in the, in the discussion from the audience. So Dmitris Mitrenko uh, basically brought up several times now that um, uh, Discord seems to be some good opportunities here in particular for breakout groups. Do you want, Dimitri, do you want to elaborate a bit more on this? If so, please unmute yourself. Maybe no microphone. Okay. Anyway, so yeah, well, Discord is, ah. Yeah, uh, I didn't hear you now. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> Oh no! You 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 brought up Discord and yes. uh, basically explained that this was uh, that that you found this quite a, a helpful tool to, for example, split uh, students into smaller groups. So I just thought you you might want to to share some of your experiences you had with this tool. Yes. So I've used Discord for a module um, called Professional Skills. Uh, so it's about presentation skills, uh, working in groups. Um, a peer assessment, etc., and I've tried it um, for the last week before the spring um, break, and um, yeah, it was quite uh, successful. So I could, for example, uh, split people into small groups, uh, dividing them between different voice channels, so they could, for example, work um, on a group assignment uh, in smaller groups, then all join the main voice channel and discuss this all together. Uh, but um, yeah, it was very difficult to control this process because people could go from one channel to another one and I have no um, tools to force, <laughs> force them in one channel, so to say. Um, and there is no video, so um, I don't see students um, and uh, uh, they don't see me uh, and only I can uh, show something on the screen so I can uh, share my screen and, and uh, show slides to them, for example, uh, but they, uh, they couldn't do that at the same time. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, in terms of voice communication, it was kind of uh, very useful, but um, it doesn't offer everything that Zoom offers, for example. Um, yeah, that's roughly my experience. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think one interesting point with Discord is that probably students are much more uh, used to Discord, at least sort of a certain subgroup of students than we as the ones teaching. So I think uh, you will find a set of gamers who have been using this quite extensively, know a lot of tricks. And I think this also creates some disbalance. I think we have this with all the digital tools. I think uh, that's something that hasn't been discussed much. The question, do you have enough room at home that everybody can have their own room to learn? Uh, what network connectivity can you afford? I think a lot of those things, uh, they, they play a role. And uh, the same thing is if we use a tool from gaming, we may give advantage to certain uh, people and disadvantage to other that may be gender, that may be background, that may be. So I think that's quite an interesting thing. A lot of the things we have learned over the last 10, 15 years in university to try to counter, that we try to balance out for those things, we may again reintroduce by having those things uh, those, those tools. 
But I think it's an interest. Uh, uh, this core is an interesting one because the functionality is is quite cool, I find. And also, I think, uh, uh, yeah, you you can do as as Dimitri just said, you can do a lot of things the other tools struggle with because they're built for these sort of short, shorter interactions you have in game. Uh, Florian, I want to add something about um, Zoom breakout rooms and small groups. Uh, and I see some questions about weaker students, so my point will connect the two. Um, so, and typically in addition to HCI courses, I teach programming courses. And this semester I'm not teaching, my colleagues are teaching, but I'm kind of checking in with them regularly to see how things are going. Uh, and one experience that um, a student shared with me is that she's typically very shy in um, during programming classes. However, this semester, instead of a programming lab in which students sit next to each other and do pair programming, so she's always aware what others are doing and what others are asking, she's working in the breakout room with another student and she can't see what other students are doing. And the instructor is kind of checking in by dropping into the breakout rooms. And she finds this experience as very empowering because she can ask questions She's not under the pure pressure of seeing how she, behind she is. She's just working in her own pace with her partners on the problems. The instructor is coming. She's not shy asking questions. And she feels that she's actually doing better than uh, in the physical lab. So I think that uh, for some students, we need to think about features, how we can actually leverage the fact that uh, we could create more intimate setup in which their questions uh, are not necessarily visible to everyone. Helen is nodding. Yeah, no. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, lessons that were learned, again, very early in the CSCW literature on, you know, meeting room systems and things like that, that, yeah. you know, if we can create, you know, sometimes it's about anonymous, you know, and this has often been done in physical spaces to try and open up. Um, again, it's, it's an issue which tends to, um, you know, that, that, that disinclination to contribute tends to be gender related, tends to be often ethnic group related, tends to be social background related. So, so actually, you know, there's, there are a whole load of problems and Albrecht's exactly right. We're gonna have other ones, you know, as people are working at home, families, there's, there's a counter set, but there is a potential also for it to be a positive um, effect in terms of removing some of the diversity and discriminatory issues that we have in education. Um, although we're going to have a few others, so in the UK we're going to, I think, face a lot of issues about selection of students this year because it's going to be based a lot more on estimated grades, which we do know tend to be uh, higher for people in higher social classes, as well as the actual grades ending up being so. But, um, but yeah, there's some real potential there to actually help as well as cause problems. Yeah. All right. So in the meantime, there is already a number of questions to Adriana. I'll just take... Oh, good. <laughs> I was already answering like, ah, I was not to interrupt. Uh, so <laughs> first coming to uh, Albrecht's uh, question about, um, well, the observation that uh, MOOCs are, um, that very few people complete them. But the thing is because we start looking at a student in a MOOC from the moment they enroll, which is very easy, very low stakes, you click, and then you lose interest, maybe don't you check it out. And they, they are just doing like their open day at the university before we start counting them in face-to-face -face instruction. So if we were already counting those people, we will find out that actually the dropout, for, for use the same word, is very high too, because we don't even admit them. We only admit the very best. To the institution so yes it's the very very motivated ones the very you know the, the stronger students that that succeed in MOOCs as well as in face-to-face -face. there is a valid point though that uh, there are there are uh, that it has been actually discussed by previous speakers that there is uh, some um, bias that were kind of a uh, embedding in here by by using a mechanism that suits certain personalities more than others but that's why we had to kind of create activities that are quite inclusive and the case that we were uh, discussing earlier about uh, the breakout groups that can actually uh, 
be addressing that uh, kind of imbalance. And another issue that I wanted to bring up when I were uh, talking about this court, I never used this court before, before now, and because I'm not a gamer, not ashamed to say that. But the first time I used it was for a conference, and it was fabulous because it was combined with Canvas, and, and there they used the videos for the talks, and then we used all the channels for for speaking to the the posters, uh, speakers, and voice channels and, and text channels. And yes, it's not easy to control, but for certain occasions you don't want to control. You want to have that kind of people talking to each other individually, not to the whole hundred people or being able to, to go into channels and talk to them about what excites them. And, and that, I think, can be very powerful for our HCI teachings. Ellen had a question related to this? Well, I, I, because I put the question in, and, uh, the question of motivation. I think uh, in Germany, for example, we cannot uh, ask students to come to lecture. So they come. Uh, if they want, they come. If they don't, they don't. So there is no way we can enforce attendance, for example. And I think my experience over the last years is uh, sort of not forcing certain things is usually benefiting the good students and the students who have less time management, uh, less personal skills. They push it to the end. And I think uh, now looking at uh, MOOCs, that was where the question came from. I think this question, how do we make it motivating? And I think some people have argued, oh, you make small chunks that keeps them motivated. But I think at some point, this sort of motivation to do a whole term, to do a whole course, that, that's uh, something. And I think some of the things, if you ask students and they're honest why they're coming, they're coming because there is this other boy, this other girl, that other person I meet, uh, people I like to hang out after the lecture because we go together for lunch. We have a coffee. So there's a lot of social situation around. And I think a lot of the things we model, be it MOOCs, be it the other stuff, misses out on those social things because the social things are very often disjoint from their study activities. So they are either at home, they have their social activities. And I think looking back at stuff that's written about open university, we've also dropout rates in, in different countries. So this is sort of this missing out on the social fabric that's created. And, and, and I think if you look back at old universities in the UK, like Cambridge or Oxford, the networks they create, that may be from a modern perspective quite questionable, how tight networks they build all the way. If, if you look in British politics, whatever, uh, I think we don't need to get started there, but I think that the, that the idea that you really link people that you created, that motivates people to also work on the courses. Has anyone had any experience in, in that space, how we link this social as the learning like this, I go to this lecture because there is the other person I really like to have coffee with afterwards. Is there something I can do? that works? Um, I was going to say, this is not an, I, it's the other way around. Um, one of the things I didn't mention, I put on my 13 words or 14 words, was um, the scaffolding of time management. And it's been a long standing open problem for, um, for online learning. Um, and then there are techniques that, that, that are used sometimes to think, do things like um, actually not having materials available, making sure that they're only time limited. Um, but yes, as you're right, some of this is to do with the, the social interactions. Having said that, so things like the Open University in the UK, I'm not quite sure what its dropout rate is, but it's not high at all. You know, I don't think it's mass any substantially higher than... Um, than physical university. I think it might be a bit higher, but given its, its majority is mature students who have a lot more barriers and things, it's actually really good. Um, and I'm not sure that, I mean, there's a, again, the full set of reasons because they don't, they, I mean, one of the crucial things is they, the Open University often included um, sort of summer schools. So there were periods uh, traditionally, and there's, uh, that's changing though now, where people would be brought together. So that this, I think, came up with um, Orit when you're talking about the people who had existing connections. So, um, so things like, you know, things that can even, it doesn't have to always be continuous. I think having small periods when people feel that they are building those contacts can be one of the ways of, 
of, of helping and perhaps not online, we have to do that in a different way. Yeah, so this is something that I was really contemplating with. How do we create this before and after class experience? Uh, not only for the students, but I think this is also a very meaningful uh, time for me personally, because this is the time that I get to chat to my students. How are you doing? How things are going? How was your weekend? All this um, natural small talk that really leads to strength and relationships. And um, two things that I noticed. Uh, one is in the beginning of this call, uh, when people come a few minutes earlier, there is this small talk conversation. So I think that's something that I would try with my classes to always open uh, a few minutes before and kind of end a few minutes after and build this space for social interaction. Of course, they cannot replace this kind of, we're going to go for coffee after class that student might have with each other. But it's an opportunity to build into this social space. Uh, the other thing that I noticed with the virtual space that happened in the last two days is that uh, one thing is that my students came together before our meeting, a day before our meeting, to decorate this space and surprise me. But that was social interaction for them to come together. The other thing that happened is that uh, yesterday, two hours after I finished my conversation with the students, I wanted to show the space to my son. So I logged into the space and two of my students were hanging out there talking to each other. So again, uh, Mozilla Hubs is by no means a perfect setup, but for now it's the proxy for a virtual space where interactions can happen. Uh, and I think that we need to find ways to build this space with Zoom or with um, Mozilla. But we, we all crave these um, experiences of before and after class. Cool. So I think we absolutely make sure that we all hang out a bit more once you're <laughs> finished with the class today. <laughs> Um, I had seen one, one interesting point that was brought forth by, by Alan already a few minutes back uh, that was regarding our, how we define the success of a, of a course. And um, maybe, Alan, you, you, you want to sort of elaborate on this a bit more. Yeah, I mean, it was partly because I saw a message, which is a classic one, which is about MOOCs and the very high um, uh, dropout rates there. And... Um, one of the things, but you also see the same said about online, about physical courses as well. And certainly in the UK, some of the more teaching focused uh, universities have higher dropout rates. And that's usually interpreted as a bad thing. And it, it knocks your grades down as a university and all sorts of things like that, you know, as how you're judged. However, if somebody leaves a course and they have succeeded in what they want to do, that should be a success, not a failure. Um, if people leave feeling they failed, that's a failure. If people feel leaving they've perhaps found all they want, or perhaps they've discovered that it wasn't the thing for them and something else might be, then we've succeeded. So um, how we, now we are judged from the outside. So there's a, there's a real problem here because those, those metrics build in this idea that people's not, um, Completing something is a failure, but perhaps we need to redefine those metrics. Um, and maybe, you know, that given this is a time of turmoil and change, this might be a time to, to try and address that. Yeah, it's, it's because these metrics typically don't measure motivation. So motivation is what's intrinsically um, defining the success. If you don't measure the motivation, you don't know why you came, you don't know what you want out of it, and you don't know if you got it. So largely this is a big discussion in, in the MOOC space. Uh, in, in the face-to-face -face instruction, you don't you assume that people are taking their degrees because they want to complete them. It's a huge commitment, especially in the UK when the fees are so high. You, you definitely want to kind of success if you finish with first class honours as well. <laughs> so the metrics is a big thing, yeah. Right, cool. Um, we had another interesting question from somebody from the West Coast, Florian Michaelis, was basically, or Florian, can you, can you join in and ask the question yourself? Else I'm happy to read it out. Or, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. So can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, perfect. So, um, I'm just getting back to teaching, so that's why I'm just asking questions. Um, I don't have that much experience so far. So um, I'm wondering, from your experience, is there any content uh, better suited than other for online versus in presence? 
Also, perhaps, what is your experience in uh, using pre-recorded material from others? I mean, we, we find so many YouTube clips or stuff where definitions are being presented and then rather using the online session for discussing and sharing viewpoints. So what's your take on that discussion versus transmission of content? I can actually quickly say something that I, I feel is, is actually a really neat uh, idea. So I was at a, uh, 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 an interview with Bill Gates, uh, maybe three or four years ago now, Microsoft Research, and uh, he was asked about online education. And one of the things that he brought up was that when he was growing up in the 50s, uh, you could go to garage band the whole, you know, the music scene was completely different than today. He, he felt that the music scene back in his younger days was a lot of small bands and everybody was, you know, having fun and that's great. And that sort of consolidated, for better or worse, into today's music scene, which is a high production value scene, right? So if you're a band, you're basically a manufactured entity with all kinds of things behind you, right? And perhaps you're still very good, but it's not a garage band. It's a band that has videos and all kinds of things. So his feeling was that that might be, in fact, what happened to courses as well, and perhaps for the best, right? So maybe I'm a super great teacher, and I should be recording my videos, and I should be telling people about topic X. But realistically, very likely there is a, an expert who, in fact, works on that. So maybe that person's videos are going to be better. And let's face it, if that person has big production value behind them. So there's a team that helps with animations or, you know, the psychology of how, you know, there, there's plenty of things that could be done better. So, you know, his feeling at least was, maybe that's a good path. At the same time, exactly, Florian, to your, your point of discussion, right? So what is our role as, as professors, as educators? Well, in fact, I find that pretty exciting because now you get to do things that truly it, they cannot be outsourced. That discussion cannot be something that can be pre-recorded. The, the work on projects, the work with smaller groups or individual students, right, that cannot be outsourced. So I think in a sense, we might be coming in as truly the people who guide our students. And then some of these videos help with content, right? And then you can build on that content. So my, I, I try to use that. I realize that, again, plenty of really good presentations out there that, that are better than what I can do. And uh, the variety is big, right? So I think that's actually very nice to use. There is something to add to that. There is one thing that to be careful of when you're using third parties uh, content, like something from YouTube for the discussion, that you can't really guarantee that it's gonna be up for the duration of your semester. And if you're gonna base your assessment on something that can be watched potentially, you have to kind of uh, risk assess for that. Maybe make a copy yourself. I don't know. There is issues with GDPR, perhaps, if you are in Europe. You know, can you reuse that content? Can uh, things with the? Uh, I don't know. That, that I imagine the institutions will discourage us strongly from using material like that for our students. No, I, I, think I think you're absolutely right, but and. Having said that, you know, I think there are some really good sources. For example, Sikkai has a YouTube channel, right? So a whole lot of the talks, especially going forward from our conferences, uh, relatively short talks will be available there. Um, you know, going back to Microsoft Research, their faculty summit, I think, is a really nice resource. And those talks are going to be online. But absolutely, you're, you're totally right. I've, I've experienced that where I, where I post something and then students come back and say, by the way, that's not available anymore. <laughs> so that's embarrassing. Yeah. I was, um, I, I'm not sure who it was actually, I was talking to somebody recently who had been in a situation where the, um, on face-to-face, -face, as in traditional thing, the lecture, the class was too big for the lecture theatre. Um, they split it and half of the class were getting it videoed in to another lecture theatre. And th but there was some sort of tutor instructors, you know, probably PhD students, teaching assistants on hand. Later on, students left. It's probably somewhere like, like Germany where you get free entry and then people leave during the course. I'm not sure, but anyway, there were less students and they could fit in. The students who were in the second lecture theatre did not want to go back because what was happening was the teaching assistant was every so often 
was sometimes would respond to something, but sometimes they weren't freezing it because it was going on. So the missing bits would, would perhaps elaborate, would say, when he said that, he means, you know, and things like that. Um, and that was really interesting because that, that actually, and they, those students felt they got the better experience from being the ones who didn't have the expert in front of them, but had the other person doing a bit of interpretation. Interesting. And, and I think sort of if you ask for the content question, I, I think for me, the things where you advise students, where you have things like practical courses, where you do coaching, that is something that uh, can be done in, in very different formats. So you can do it face to face, but you can do it over the phone. And I think that's something which at first it looks like, oh, this has to be something face to face. But if you coach people, individuals or small groups, I find this even sort of for, for projects, for master's thesis, I think their remote is not really uh, the issue. What I find is sort of this medium sized class. So if you teach for 500, I think uh, there is not much interaction anyway. So that, that's not, that's again something that's fairly easy. That's a MOOC anyway. In, 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 in. Well, what I find difficult is if you have something where you have between, let's say, 30 and 100, uh, which you can typically manage very well in a classroom. But this is really hard to do something like in a Zoom because you, you, you don't get that, that interaction. And content-wise, uh, I think this idea, what, is, what good content is out there? And I think there is an infinite number of snippets. But uh, in some ways, it is much easier to put your own stuff together because very often as academics, we have an understanding how we want to teach that and also at what speed we want to teach, how deep we want to dive into certain things. And I think the time it takes to get all these bits and pieces. So I think it's very easy for a definition if, if, if somebody says it or, or, but I think to get the bits and pieces together, and I think Ellen said this at the beginning, the effort you can spend in sort of creating this, uh, this stuff is, is, is pretty big. But I think there may be sort of an AI solution coming around the corner. All right. Um, so we already touched upon briefly about a question that Susanne Boll brought up uh, before, which is uh, which regards the scalability of the types of courses that we are teaching. I know, Susanne, do you want to say a bit more about the background of your question? We don't hear you. What's up for Susanne, the question? Yeah, Susanne, but I think we cannot hear Hello? her. Yes, perfect. Ah. Um, sorry, it, it, sometimes it starts into sleep mode. Um, so uh, I it, maybe a little bit, I'm a little bit um, worried because I think if you teach in Germany, you have still have this, there, you have two things at the same time. You are often also teaching large classes, which is 100 or some people have 200 or 300 individuals sitting there. And you don't have the support structure. Of course, you have like student tutors, but they are not prepared now for online teaching. So this is hard to now get them into supporting you where they were very used to, to do uh, like teaching smaller groups. And the second is that you formally have a lot of teaching load per term. So that means all of a sudden you're jumping into two problems which you, I think most of us will somehow manage, but sort of, at the, and then, then finally say, and this has to be like a, 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 an excellent online experience for everyone is I think it's, it's, it's raising the bar very high. So I haven't still haven't seen online solutions that really do very well. Of course, we will all survive with large groups uh, and do our best. But I think giving you have a large need teaching load plus a large number of students. Um, I'm, I'm very worried that we will be exactly doing what has been said before. We try to stream or twitch large numbers of our lectures, which are pretty boring after a while, you know, because it, if you, it's, it's difficult to have the same, at least for me, I have to learn to do the same enthusiasm on screen that I may be having class. So I haven't heard of someone running it successfully in large groups because most of the discussion was on the smaller thing. Any answers to say, or just help me and say, it's not doable anyway, so I feel relieved. So one of the things I, I commented, sorry to jump in there, but uh, peer wise I mentioned, it actually works much better with large numbers of people because you go 
more people producing questions and then there's a pool a richer pool of questions to answer for people who come in it's not just two or three that were seated by the by the instructor there were lots of people that and you get more of a community sense with with uh, peer wise um, so my two cents and you did it how, how did you technically support it so uh, uh, peer wise it's a uh, for creating multiple choice questions so this is no video this is just uh, you set up you may set up the instructions by video and you say how to join in but it's a software that lives in new zealand because that's where it was created there are many universities across the world using it and it's basically a template and it lends itself for gamification which is why it works very well because people start competing on who's got the most answers who's got the most correct answers you can also give um rank the how good the answer is or how difficult it is. And then there are badges that you can win. So it, and all is done by the, by the system. You don't have to do anything other than moderate the questions because sometimes people will make silly questions. But if you have very good ground rules to start with, this is gonna happen, and you introduce, and you have to put some value to that. Because we, we ran this experience two years in a row. So the first year we, have, we took 5% of the module for for creating the questions not necessarily assessing the quality of them because we're scared about this the scalability you know how we're going to mark all these questions but just the participation and it was really good whereas in the second semester with the second time we used it we decided not to put assessment because of all well, this is very useful for the for revision it was a very positive experience the, the semester prior so i thought this will work regardless and it didn't because they didn't see they were going to be assessed so they didn't participate and there weren't that many questions so the experience wasn't that great and maybe as a tiny follow-up how well do you think that the h the topic of hci is doable in in kind of questions so that's that, also a challenge that is that was challenging because obviously it, it lends itself more for fact uh, based questions like in maths or where it's only one answer but because you can comment you can put you can select a b c d what's the correct answer but you can also put comments and the creator of the question can answer to your comments so in a way that replicates a bit like ha what happens in MOOCs and then the the the, the, the teacher the, the lecturer can intervene and can say Thing. So it's, it's a threat that happens. So really it doesn't matter if you got the question correct or not, if the question, you know, if it's something that it's judged, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a point of discussion. But obviously it works better when it's a clear answer and the distractors are such that. that I think there, there may be a, another sort of an old solution to this. And I think uh, you studied roughly the same time as I studied. I think uh, at that time there were no continuous assessments. So basically, after basically you studied two years, there were uh, three exams or four exams, and uh, nobody told you how to get there. So basically, you, you study for two years, there are exams, you can take them, you cannot take them, there are assessments you can do, but what counts is basically these exams. And I think over the last 20 years, we went in our uh, academic system in our teaching system back to we assess every bit and piece now we are down to writing a uh, exam for everything and so i think taking this step back we have this big amount of content we have all these things uh and i think after two years there are four exams uh, and basically after two years there is an exam on hci and it's not an intelligent user interface is on this on that it's basically on hci mm -hmm. and you are supposed to know everything what's to know there. Obviously, this is sort of going back into Stone Age, but at the moment, I think this is sort of something, given the material that's out there, that's not as unattractive as it sounds. Yeah, I was gonna, yeah, just pop in into, I mean, two things. One is, where, as you were describing, Suzanne, I was looking at the title of this session, and I was thinking, thinking about large classes in general, but by large, of course, we don't mean large. Um, Albrecht mentioned AI, um, MOOCs, you know, 200 is the mid ground and it's possibly difficult and the, the, I mean I think things up here wise pick that out the bigger you got the group the easier but I was thinking about 
uh, you know, how to make in-class HCI teaching useful, engaging, exciting, you know, is your physical course really better than a book? And it is actually a challenge. Um, <laughs> However, you know, uh, but on that, um, I was, uh, for you know, you know Interaction Design Foundation, and uh, I, mean, I think I lost a few do yet. Um, so I've done some courses, and they ask you for multiple choice questions, and there is really good, um, apart from I'm a rob rubbish scholar, so I can't find the, the references, for it, but there's really good evidence, I know, on the fact that if you put those in, it really increases engagement. Um, and of course, the, what they do is the multiple choice questions don't, test knowledge they test whether you've been engaged in the learning experience which is not the same and it, it's about creating the learning experience and i had to do these we've got a, um, a course i'm not sure if it's just been released or about to be released on creativity with interaction design foundation multiple choice questions on creativity right you are not trying to assess you know or even help them learn creativity in those multiple choice questions. But what they do do is help them maintain engagement with material. So it's really, it's, it's interesting, different, different kinds of things. But, um, but yeah, so even, even creativity, you can do MCQs. <laughs> there is actually a, just a question came in, I think to, to Ellen from Ramesh Ramlal um, about, Gaze awareness. Do you want to read out the question? Hi, hi, Alan. It's Ramesh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was wondering. You know, when when I was uh, at Lancaster University, we used to have, you know, when CSCW research was big, we were talking a lot about gaze awareness and its importance in collaborative conversation. And here I am with uh, so many people <laughs> in front of me. And I'm wondering, you know, is it still important or is it as important as we made it to be? I do understand it kind of important if we are, let's say, around a table, like building a molecule or something, then you can see what I'm interested in. But apart from the situations, um, you know, uh, what do you think about it? I mean, just was interested to know. So I said the um, the bit I, one is it's really lovely to see you again. It's been a lot, you know. Though we've I had the odd Facebook in between, I've not actually seen your face for so many years. Um, but yeah, I mean the thing I was mentioning at the beginning, the, I think gaze is still important, and that, that's um, what I was talking about when I got interrupted by my phone. Was actually I, I found really small changes in my physical setup made a big change, but this was for pre-recording. That was not for face-to-face -face or live live work um you know the ability um by changing my position i made it that my eyes when they looked at the screen looked down at the slides so if you did picture in picture my eyes did the right things just by care just by positioning my, my cam um, camera and i also found that by having a separate camera i saw the camera as my audience and I would look at them and then look at the screen. Rather, you know, it changed that change. However, the other thing I have realized is we have become so used to not, you know, when we do video stuff in general, I think we've become much more tolerant of not having those gaze. Now, what we lose from that, I don't know, it's really hard, um, but um, it's not, it's not as big an issue as it used to be. I mean, I think some of that is the fact that a, a built-in camera, although it, it is noticeably wrong, and um, again, with pre-recording, I discovered this with the, um, the, if you have a camera with a flap out, I have to put a sock over the flap out screen because otherwise I look at myself. And that distance is about that far from, if you imagine being a person, it's like looking at their year. And it is amazing how awful that is. So, so for the live stuff, it doesn't seem to matter as much. Um, but for, weirdly, very, very weirdly, but for the pre-recorded stuff, it seems to make a much bigger difference. And getting that right really changes the dynamic because it, it is very odd if somebody constantly looks at your ear. It's just odd. <laughs> so I think tools like Zoom have this attention tracking in. So our university license has switched it off because it doesn't really work well with German law, I heard. So basically the, the license we're using, uh, they basically we have a license where this is switched off 
and I just posted in the Zoom chat, we had at Augmented Human a keynote uh, of Ankeleda Kasneski, and she does eye tracking research and she can track a whole classroom sort of in real life and you can get a score. And I think it's, it's a question, technically I think we can track a lot of attention, but the question is how meaningful is it really? And, and so I think that that question, what is sort of the aim of, of tracking the, the attention and how much do we give students sort of the space, what they wanna do, how they wanna succeed or, or not? And I think that's, that's sort of the, the bigger question that gets around. All right. I think cool. it's really interesting too the you know the question Alan posed about you know what is success, and um, I think you have also it's it's also interesting to think about different groups of students and what their goals are right. So again, some people are there to to get some particular skills, and then uh, some of them will are, are aiming for one particular type of of work right, and then other people are aiming for something else. So there are those people who might end up being the leaders in the field and there are those people who might end up being very productive by that different positions right so the, the people who make up those big big teams have to be that they're they're our charts too right they're the ones who are we're educating and they they might have a different view of what they wish to learn and um and i think it gets complicated and then, then it becomes also a question of what albert was saying about assessment right so in a sense there's this really nice uh, idea of yeah I'm gonna have this this really big question to you right so if you want to go back to my pet uh, story about generating new knowledge then truly why would you be assessing you know can they do two plus two you really want to ask them can you you know work on a project successfully um, but that might not be the appropriate thing for everybody because maybe someone will be working on that team on that project and really they will be told what to do to a large extent, and you need their expertise in being able to code certain things or 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 figure out what the frequency content of the signal is, and then you know filter it. I cool. think that. Uh, sorry, can I add sure. something about assessment? I think when we were focusing on assessing student learning, I think that another kind of possible challenge for us, uh, not yet, but in the near future, will be how do we assess faculty teaching. Uh, many, in many places, junior faculty promotion is tied into faculty teaching. We were all thrown in this completely new world. Uh, I know that many institutions um, canceled faculty evaluation, kind of teaching evaluation for this semester, but what will happen in the next year or so? So this is something for us collectively to think about guidelines, not only for assessing student learning, but also how do you assess success as an instructor in a course, are we going back to student evaluation questionnaires or uh, what does it mean to have, in my institution, we have uh, senior faculty visiting the classroom of junior faculty. How is that looking in this new world? And it's more of a question rather than um, an answer. I was, it's interesting, this morning I was writing a mail to um, our, effectively our um, diversity team and asking exactly that question that, you know, not necessarily it's an immediate, there's other things that are more immediate, but something we need to visit quite soon is how the shutdown is affect, you know, will affect people differently. I've got a grown up family. Um, I think, wow, I've got, I mean, actually it's, it gets very busy very fast, but I've got more time than normal. If I had small children, I'd be in a very different situation um it and that will hit you know just like we were talking about students it will hit different groups in society so so and and again it will be different for academics um, but there'll also be issues for other ones and this is in the sh for a very short period it's not going to be an issue but i think we're going to have things happening for at least a year um and that's good that's going to impact careers yeah so um so yeah that was that again it was a question i was saying i think we need to you know, as in our team within the university, we need to be talking about this actively now um, in order to try and um, make sure that this doesn't, isn't a problem that's gonna come back and hit us in a year's time. So. And I think part of this conversation need to take um, kind of a place within institutions, but I think part of this conversation, like SIG CHI guidelines for tenure, needs to take place within the professional organization of what does it mean to take HCI? 
Uh, I think that students' expectations are changing, faculty expectations are changing. Uh, maybe there is even, right we, before we discussed what kind of content should go into online courses versus, uh, and I think there is the place for uh, more SIGCHI kind of discussions on this topic or ACM more broadly. Right, cool. So before we get to the end, we can maybe very briefly touch upon one question that's been floating around uh, about the, the pitfalls. And I think Bastian had a question on uh, copyright issues and whether people run into such problems. So maybe one of the panelists yeah, has something to say about that or is already nodding. <laughs> I was noting because of the one of the answers that appeared, which uh, you probably already you're probably already running into these problems, except uh, now they are at a different scale. Does it, does anybody have have more insights to share about the do's and don'ts and where where you really need to watch out to not run into any copyright issues, or maybe Bastian wants to comment on it. Well, so luckily, I uh, don't have to do a let's say more traditional lecture this uh, this semester, uh, which is already done. So that's 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 a nice thing about it. But so I, I hear it also like from my colleagues that they're really struggling with 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 these things because obviously, kind of depending on which platform you use, uh, you you already you have these issues, and that's why I was just wondering. I mean, obviously, we know all the rules and so on, but typically, there's always this one piece of I don't know, video or whatever, which you really want to show your students, but we just think, well, I can't do that given the license which uh, which which is given for that piece of piece of. Uh, um, I think, I think there, there, it's, it's a very tough thing. But there are, uh, I think, there is a lot of information out there. I think one of the tricky things is there is uh, the global world, and I think you have different rules in different countries, yeah. and I think we have been doing over the last weeks. Uh, rework content we had before mainly at the university of stuttgart with some of the people together <laughs> and trying to make this creative commons uh compatible and mm -hmm. i think it is some work but in the end it's, it's not impossible because of things like a lot of the academic papers it's fairly easy uh, there are rules about how long snippets of stuff you can use uh, if you discuss it so i think if you go into the details it is not that impossible anymore uh, and I think uh, th there are a number of ideas of, of workarounds, but I think in the end, uh, the nice thing with online is if there is a piece of video you cannot show, which is online, you can embed sort of a link to it. So I think it's much easier than in the classroom. So I think uh, I, I find the copyright question is something we haven't been taking seriously over the last uh, 20 years. And I think it's still one of these big issues in in teaching i think if we would not have copyright on teaching material uh, that would be completely different but i think we are not there so i think given that it, it is something that hinders teaching but at the same time uh, there are a lot of ways to, to work with it there is uh, and i think there's also for example publishers like acm if you use a picture out of there they have a very clear statement they will not go after you after the individual if you discuss it because that's sort of in most countries within the law so i think it, it is something it's more tricky we usually don't want to engage with it but we at some point have to engage with it uh, in order to make it and i think the the other question there is we should probably make some effort when we put something out to put it under creative commons that we can reuse it and that we have a certified piece that i can reuse and i think if we look at the size of the community we are now about 100 people in that call and another 20 or 30 in twitch so if people are doing sort of one or two slides and they do them well and they're under creative commons we have a lot of slides out there i think at the moment it's mainly we're a bit too lazy to do it right and that creates this that everybody who reuses this has to go through it again and again so i would rather argue let's create less material but let's create a material we create with creative commons that we can use it and i think may I just thank you albrecht i think adding to that i think we started doing this uh with our courses um in recent years exactly for that reason also because we actually had an issue of someone being um, like trying to be nasty to us uh, and so we got uh, a good reason to walk over our own slides 
Um, and also, I think it's a wonderful time in which you have all these places, I think Pixar Bay and Pix here and so on. So there's a lot of online photography you can really use to illustrate and make your case. You know, I think that was actually something that wasn't around some years ago. And this is very beneficial because if you still underline it with your enthusiastic teaching of what it actually means and why it illustrates something, I think it's really doable. And I think also maybe as an addition, what we haven't done is to create a stronger pool of material from our own prototypes. Some is going into the papers, some is not. Um, and, and allow others uh, to share it. And I think ACM has a fair share of use web page. Um, so I would, well, maybe also because um, I'm uh, probably too old for this to be frightened, but I wouldn't be worried too much if you take a good sense of, a uh, good common sense of what you put into your slides and, and think in mind, would you consider yourself this a fair share of use? I don't think that each of us will now be running into a, a bunch of lawsuits. I don't believe that. I, mean, I know personally, this is something I, I, for years, I just threw things into my slides, but always made them available from very early points on the web. And then at some point realized that I was not, you know, and furthermore, I didn't know where a lot of things came from. And that's not helped. That's a good HCI lesson for us all. It's not helped by a lot of the tools we use do not make it easy to track provenance. When you put an image into a Word document, I don't, unless there maybe there is some way, but I don't know an easy way to put where it came from. Um, so then if you, you know, you see a lot of, I mean, I, I find the Google, you know, the Google image search that says usage rights is utterly useless because basically it tells you 50,000 blogs that have used a picture that's been copied from somewhere else. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've gone, oh, and then this is both for books as well as teaching materials, as much as possible for things that have already got very, very clear Creative Commons, like a lot of Wikimedia, um, again, um, you know, things like Flickr, but only when it's the person's own one, you know, you're really cautious. Um, but there's also the big OER community out there. I don't know how many people are aware of the open education resource community. There's um, a very strong community about ways of trying to develop this. But I said, as HCI people, when we're designing tools, you know, if it's a blogging platform, if it's a word processor, if it's a, um, a slide generation platform, we should be thinking, how do we help people track provenance so that these issues are ones that are not about you know, trying to find these in the last minute, but since they're built into our whole practices. Right. No so. does this automatically. Whenever you paste something, it puts underneath where it comes from. Microsoft Notes does it automatically. Ah, okay. <clears throat> right, cool. Looking at the time, we're, we're close to 6.30, uh, which leaves us roughly two minutes for giving each of our panelists the opportunity for a 10 second closing statement and uh, just keep in mind that after we, we end this we can still uh, hang around for some more minutes as we already learned and all right so i think we just this time start from the from the back of the list and everybody could just like sort of take 10 seconds to share with the community what they they think was the most interesting thing they learned today um what they want us all to sort of keep in mind when teaching whatever Andrew, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I really like the discussion overall. I, I'm, I'm really thinking about the evaluation part and how that would be, that would better fit my idea of, of uh, training people for generating new knowledge. Excellent. Adriana. Yeah, my main takeaway was from Orit when she said that the, the new normal that she wanted to foster is a sense of community, integrating creativity, hands-on learning, and solving meaningful problems. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so I think that this discussion was very uh, successful in creating a sense of community. So thank you for bringing us together for this. I think that uh, this will have to be a series of ongoing conversations as all of us are learning more about how to do this and how to do this right. And I think this uh, it feels almost like seeing you all in person and coming together um, in Kai kind of the following week. All right, Ellen. <laughs> okay, 
So first of all, I say if we continue in the conversation, if you want to, on Thursday afternoon, we've got this um, for HCIM video workshop. So if you're uh, interested in that, that'll be continuing. Um, I guess the thing that is something I thought of before as, as, as an issue, but came up here, which I think is worth us really keep in mind is that every person, and that's tutors and um, students, have very different circumstances. They've got different personalities, um, and but also different um, home circumstances. And I think this really brings that home. It was true in the classroom, but I think it brings home. And I think this part of a new normal is to um, make sure that we don't forget that lesson when we, when we go away from this. Thank you, Ellen. Albrecht. I just post in uh, Alan's link uh, for the uh, thing on, on Thursday. And I think what, what I take away is the question, not just about teaching, that we should really think about assessment much more. What Andrew came up, because a lot of the teaching is based on how we assess. And so really taking from, looking from the back, not looking from what we want to teach, looking from what people should learn how we want to assess this and then going backwards and think how we can do the teaching. And there is probably another reference we see here, Adriana, I love those, shield, those, those signs. And with this, I think we are uh, over. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. We're still at something like 125, 130 people on two different channels. Uh, so again, much more than expected. As uh, last Tuesday, initially we thought we have it internally, this discussion, but I think it's quite helpful to get so many ideas from you. And uh, I think I've benefited a lot. And perhaps there will be another topic we will discuss at uh, some other point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much also to the panelists. Have a great day. Um, thank you. Morning, evening, wherever on earth you are. <laughs> Take care. Bye.